<laughs> you know, ready? Should I just start? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this afternoon we will have an uh, informal uh, uh, series of uh, how to make this competition problem. Just that um, give me less than uh, S and the time, uh, there's no time limit in this case for about one, one hour or two hours or two seconds. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll take a break. Okay. Let's stop. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, what I'd like to do is give just a, a, an introduction to the matrix completion theory. And uh, I'll try to indicate some places where there are directions I could go, but that I'm not taking the time to go right now. And then if somebody wants to chat, we can talk about those things. Uh, before I get into that, though, uh, for those of you who went out last night and are having difficulty today, I have, I have a sobering example for you. Uh, I wanted to mention this yesterday, but I was a little behind on time, so I didn't. So, uh, this example is uh, to point out the idea that it's difficult for sign pattern matrices to, to define the notion of rank. And, uh, so uh, you might here's a sign pattern, and you might ask the question, uh, what 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 should I say is the rank of this? Well, I might say that it's some sort of minimum rank. Okay, and now the question is, how how do I assess minimum rank? Well, in this example, uh, the following turns out to be the case. If I pick any so ah, that was it. So if I look at these three rows, uh, they uh, imply that the matrix must be linearly independent, that the, those three rows must be linearly independent. So that means that any matrix with this uh, sign pattern uh, uh, must have rank at least three. On the other hand, if I look at the columns of this matrix and I take any three columns at all, then those three columns allow linear dependence. Okay? And so uh, there's a big difference between looking at the rows and looking at the columns in this example. And I just wanted to point this out uh, to show that things require a good deal of care uh, when you're talking about ranks of sign patterns. Maybe uh, if someone is interested, we can chat a little, a little more about that later. Uh, okay, let me get to the main course. Uh, and what I want to do is uh, a fairly careful introduction, but uh, as I say, it will just be uh, somewhat brief. So, so the idea is the following. The, the basic object is what I call a partial matrix. And by that, I simply mean a rectangular array in which some of the entries are specified. We don't get to change those under any circumstances. And the remaining entries are unspecified. And we get to choose those uh, arbitrarily in, uh, in any way that we want. Okay? So I've got uh, specified entries here in blue, unspecified entries in green. And I can think of these unspecified entries as, as three variables over some set, such as the complex numbers, whatever field we're working over, or whatever you like. Okay? Now, a completion of this partial matrix simply, simply means some choice of values for each of the unspecified entries, resulting in a good old ordinary matrix. Okay? So once I, once I choose values for the unspecified entries, I have an ordinary matrix. And a completion problem simply asks, is, does there exist a completion with some desired property? For example, positive definite. Uh, a given rank, being a contraction, being a matrix of distances, whatever you want. Okay? 
so that's the case. Pardon? Pardon. 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 Now, such problems that we just mentioned briefly arise in quite a few different ways. I'm sort of keeping the list here, uh, and I keep running into more of them. Uh, I won't be able to say much at all about uh, any of these, but uh, uh, one of them is a classical statistical problem in which you have missing data, and you'd like to make some estimate of the missing data that you have. Uh, another another uh, kind of problem that interests me that I uh, just barely touched on yesterday is determinantal inequalities. Uh, and in fact, you can use completion theory to say quite a bit about determinantal inequalities. Uh, there are connections with a fairly new subject called the semi-definite programming, uh, which is a nice way to, uh, to get solutions to a, a lot of solved problems. So there's there's a uh, Connections with a lot of things here. Um, so I, I mentioned missing data problems. Let me just elaborate on that slightly. So if I have a vector random variable, the variance covariance matrix is always a positive semi-definite matrix. And if I have some fragment of the variance covariance matrix because I have partial data, uh, then that guy must be must have some positive set, semi definite completion. It's just that I don't know what completion. And uh, there's a there's a method called maximum entropy estimation, which means that you should pick the determinant maximizing positive semi definite completion. And that turns out to be the best estimate of the various covariance matrix, assuming that you have no other information. So that's a, that's a sort of classic statistical problem uh, where some of these ideas are used. Okay, now let me return to the uh, theory. Uh, and as you will see, the positions in the matrix where the specified entries lie are extremely important uh, in all of this. And so it's nice to have a, a bookkeeping device to keep track of the locations of the specified entries. So I'll, divide the, uh, I'll describe those locations by a graph. And uh, that graph, as, as yesterday, uh, might be directed or undirected depending on the nature of the problem. Uh, typically, I will put an edge to correspond exactly to a specified entry. Uh, in most of the problems that I'll talk about, I'll have some form of symmetry. And so this graph will be a graph on n vertices where the partial matrix is n by n. And it will be an undirected graph because the ij entry will be specified exactly where the ji entry is specified. Uh, so that, that would be the most common. Here's a, just a simple example of having an idea. Um, so suppose I have this pattern for my partial matrix. Blue entries specify green question marks for unspecified entries. Then the graph is simply as I've described here. The one, two entry and two, one entries are specified. So one, two is an edge in the graph. And furthermore, in most problems, the diagonal entries will be specified. And so I will not bother to write loops on, on the graph. Okay? We'll just take for granted that the diagonal entries are specified. In most problems, that is a natural assumption. OK, so we have a graph that just describes the positions. And now there's a, an idea that uh, I, I want to share with you. It's not necessarily important to solving any particular problem, but it simply tells us something about the existence of a solution, which is uh, worth knowing if you're going to invest some time trying to solve the problem. And uh, the idea here is the following. I'll say that a property about matrices is real polynomially describable 
RTD for short. If I can characterize whether or not a matrix has that property via a finite list of polynomial inequalities in real variables. Now, I don't require that the matrix itself have real entries. I only require that I can characterize this property in terms of real variables, and I'll be more specific about that uh, in a moment. Um, now, if we happen to be working with a real polynomially describable property P, and we know the graph of the specified entries, then uh, it's a consequence of some ideas from real algebraic geometry that there's always a finite list of conditions that depend on the graph now, a uh, finite list of conditions on the specified entries that characterize whether or not our partial matrix is completable to a matrix with property D. Okay? So in that sense, there will be a solution to our problem uh, if this property is real polynomially describable. Now, the good news is that essentially any property that anybody ever worries about is real polynomially describable. Okay? Uh, and I'll, I'll give some examples in just a moment. So in that event, the general question is how to relate the structure of the graph to the conditions of There are a couple of properties that I have not been able to prove are real polynomially describable, and maybe they aren't real polynomially describable, but for the most part, everything that you can think of is. Uh, and if you could come up with a good example of a natural matrix property that is not real polynomially describable, I would, I would love to have that example just for uh, completeness. Uh, one of the ones that I'm not sure of is the property that the field of values of a matrix, uh, the numerical range, if you like, lies in the unit disk. Okay? I don't know whether that's real polynomially describable or not. Uh, probably it's not, but I, uh, I don't know. Okay, let me be a little more specific. Uh, here, here are some of the properties that, are, that I know to be real polynomially uh, uh, in, in each case, the, uh, the properties uh, here are um, real polynomially describable. Uh, and let me let me just take one one particular example to show that it's a lot of properties are real polynomially describable, even though it's not so obvious that they are. So, for example, the property of being a contraction uh, in the uh, spectral norm uh, is real polynomially describable. And so, just to make things simple, let me say strict contraction here so that the spectral norm should be less than 1. So, this happens exactly when this block matrix is positive definite. And that matrix is positive definite if and only if its leading principal minors are positive. So if this matrix was n by n, there's uh, just n plus n leading principal minors. And in fact, I don't even need that many because up here I have the identity. But in any event, at most, n plus n. And I can think of those leading principal minors uh, as polynomials in the real and, and imaginary parts of the entries of A. Okay? So, I can write down a finite list of polynomial conditions in the real and imaginary parts of the entries of A that characterize whether this matrix is positive definite and therefore characterize whether A is a, a strict contraction. And so the property of A being a strict contraction, even over the complexes, is a real polynomially describable property. Okay? So that's just an example here. So lots of properties are, and if the property is real polynomially describable, then I can, uh, uh, well, there exists a finite list of conditions on the data to tell me whether 
I have a completion or not. The whole problem is to find those conditions, and typically that's not, not an easy task. So what I'd like to do for, uh, for the next half hour or so is give a discussion of the, the, of the property where completion theory is the most fully developed. And that's the case of, of the positive definite completion problem. <clears throat> and in this case now, we can be much more specific about the nature of the matrix. So I should have, first of all, a partial permission matrix, which means that my rectangular array is square. And it means that whenever the ij entry is specified, then the ji entry is also specified. And they are complex conjugates of each other. So this is what I'm going to be assuming now for the next, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And so the question then is, when is there a positive definite completion? And there's an obvious necessary condition for this. And that is that the matrix be what we call partial positive definite. And that simply means that every principal submatrix consisting entirely of specified entries must itself be positive definite or every fully specified principal minor must be a positive number. Okay? So that's an obvious necessary condition because the property of being positive definite is inherited by principal submatrices. So when I look at the data, everything that I can see had better at least be positive definite. Okay? Now, the first case I know of, of the study of such a problem, was in the PhD thesis of John Berg, which was in geophysics at Stanford uh, in 1975. And Berg studied the case in which there's just one symmetrically placed pair of unspecified entries. Okay? Berg was interested in oil exploration problems, and he made uh, a great deal of uh, hay out of, out of just this very simple problem. And in fact, uh, he later became a consultant to the oil industry, used some of these ideas, and he's made a lot of money. So uh, you can go quite a long way with something fairly simple uh, if you know how to apply it properly. Well, in this case, the, the determinant of this matrix is uh, a quadratic in this X, or permission quadratic, if you like, in a complex case. And our assumption of partial positive definiteness just means that this upper left block and this lower right block are both ordinary positive definite matrices. And that and we need to assume that in order to have a chance of having a positive Furthermore, the set of X's that gives me a positive definite completion is a disk. Uh, over the complex numbers, or in the case we're working over the reals, it's a line segment. And in either event, the center of that disk or the line segment gives me the, the maximum determinant completion. And furthermore, one way to characterize the, the x that works, that gives me the maximum determinant completion, is that when I invert the completion with the correct x, I will get zero in the corners. Okay. So the inverse will have zeros in the corners. So a natural question now arises here, and that is, what are the patterns for the specified entries? What graphs, if you will, have the property that I can extend this uh, nice, this nice result to more to those more general patterns? Well, the first result in that direction, uh, and actually the result that got me interested in the subject was in a paper by uh, Harry Dinn and Israel Doctor in Linear Algebra and its Applications way back in 1981. And in that case, they assumed that the uh, pattern for the specified entries was banded. That is, all the specified entries lived inside some, some bandwidth, and every entry there was specified. And then outside, I have all the unspecified entries. And furthermore, they made this partial positive definite assumption, which, uh, you know, in, in, in my terminology, they assume that this is partial positive definite. And that is just to assume that all the principal sub-matrices lying inside this bandwidth is uh, all those principal sub-matrices are 
positive definite. Okay. And they reached three, uh, three remarkable conclusions under those assumptions. First of all, again, just as in the Berg case, there's always a positive definite completion. And then secondly, among the positive definite completions, there's a unique one with maximum determinant. One and only one has the maximum determinant. And furthermore, uh, there's a unique completion that is invertible and has zeros in the inverse in outside the bands. And that is exactly the uh, maximum determinant completion. Okay? So uh, there's a nice characterization of the determinant maximizing guy. It's the only one that's invertible and has a banded inverse in the usual sense. Okay? Now, you can view this as a generalization of some classical results like Pierre Theodore Fader uh, from the couplets case of this, but uh, I, I, I won't go into that. Now, uh, we, uh, I, I was fortunate enough when this paper came out to have, uh, well, shortly after this paper came out, to have several visitors uh, at uh, Marquis de Sa from Portugal, Bob Brown. Uh, and Henry Wolkowitz, and we looked at this result and we were kind of curious as to what was really behind it. And so we asked the, the natural question is, what, what other patterns work? And uh, so let me tell you about how, how that problem is solved. Uh, first of all, let me convince you that not every pattern has this nice property of uh, ensuring that a, positive, a partial positive definite matrix has a positive definite Okay. So, uh, in order to give an example, I'm going to now fudge a little bit and talk about positive semi-definite completions. It turns out that there's really no difference. Okay. So, here's a, here's a partial matrix. Again, specified entries in blue, unspecified entries in green. I've got two different unspecified entries. I'll just stick with the real case here uh, to keep things simple. This matrix, it's easy to check partial positive semi-definite. Okay, every fully specified principal submatrix is positive semi-definite. And if I were to uh, complete this matrix, I would have to be able to pick a value for x that kept me partial positive semi-definite. Okay? But in order to, to do that, I have to realize that x completes a couple of different 3x3 three three principal submatrices. And here they are. One of them lies in positions 2, 3, 4. It's this one. And the other one lies in positions 1, 2, and 4. And it's this one. And in order to, to be positive semi-definite, I have to choose a value for x that makes both of these positive semi-definite. And in this case, x has to be minus 1 in order to be positive semi-definite. And despite all the wonders of modern mathematics, I can't do both of those things at the same time. And so I conclude that there's no positive semi-definite completion of the original uh, partial positive semi-definite matrix. And you can see that the difficulty here lay in the conflict between these two different uh, principal submatrix that it, principal submatrices that x completes. Okay? So somehow there's a conflict inherent in this arrangement of entries that was not arrangement is was not inherent in other arrangements of entries. So in order to tell you about the uh, the uh, patterns that do work, I need to uh, tell you a little bit about a nice class of graphs called portal graphs. And these are always undirected graphs. An undirected graph is portal exactly if it has no minimal simple cycles of length four or more, where I measure length now in terms of the number of edges. Okay? And what do I mean by a simple cycle? Well, I mean that it has no uh, 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 repeated vertices until I come back to the end of the cycle. And uh, another way of putting this is that if I have a cycle in the graph, that cycle must have a chord, that is an edge cutting across the cycle. So for example, here's a uh, four cycle without chords. So this graph is not chordal. 
Here's a graph that is portal because, uh, well, there's a four cycle, but that four cycle has a four. Okay. Now, these graphs have arisen in a lot of other places. Uh, for example, in numerical linear algebra, they're very important because they uh, turned out to be the answer to the question, what are the uh, zero, non-zero patterns on which you can generically form, perform Gaussian elimination and avoid any filling? Okay, so they, they've been important in the analysis of numerical methods for partial differential equations, for example. Uh, they're heavily studied in various applications, and typically portal graphs are computationally very nice because a lot of graph theory problems that are hard in general turn out to be easy for portal graphs. They have uh, linear or perhaps a more quadratic uh, algorithms uh, to solve them. Nonetheless, they're fairly general. They, they arise in a lot of different uh, situations. Uh, and for example, all trees are portal, uh, obviously. And in fact, if, you, uh, if you're a wealthy person and you take out a German 10-mark note from your wallet, you happen to have one, and look on the back, there's a picture of Gauss on the front of the note. And on the back of the note is a portal graph that uh, comes from uh, the geodesic calculations that Gauss made about the uh, layout of several German cities. So, portal graphs are very important. They even appear on the back of the German 10 mark note. Okay, well, so I gave you the definition of a portal graph, but here's a very useful way of thinking of them, characterization, if you will, that's, that's very handy in applications. So, uh, the idea is the following. Uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, a clique in a graph is simply a complete subgraph. So suppose I have a big pile of cliques over here, complete graphs of various sizes. And uh, I build up a new graph in the following way. I pick out a clique, perhaps this black one, and plop it down. And then I pick out another clique, maybe this green one, and I identify the new clique along a subclique of both it and the old clique that I, that I picked out before. And once I make that identification, I have a new graph. Here it is. Now I take out another clique, say this red one, and I identify the new clique, uh, I identify a subclique of the new clique with a subclique of the graph that I've constructed thus far, and I get a new graph, and I continue. Here's a new clique, I identify a a subclique of it with a subclique of the graph that I made so far, and I keep building up a graph. Okay? Well, it turns out that any graph that I build in that way is portal. And furthermore, all portal graphs can be built in this way. So this is a nice way to think of portal graphs. And it's also very nice for inductive proofs, because often that means a problem reduces to uh, a portal graph with fewer cliques corresponding to some matrix down here, and then the next clique that I bring in overlapping along some existing clique. So typically, I'm just obligated to analyze a situation in which I have something that I know about by an inductive hypothesis and this overlapping clique. So, so typically, things come down to a simple situation. Uh, guess the theorem, and this was a theorem that was uh, proved by my three visitors and myself, in, in, and it appeared in LAA in 1984, and it answers the question, what are the patterns for partial positive definite matrices that ensure that there must be a positive definite completion without knowing anything other than the fact that we're partial positive definite? Okay? And the answer is, those patterns are exactly the ones corresponding to portal graphs. Okay? So uh, if you give me a graph, and I, I will know that every partial positive definite matrix whose graph is that graph has a positive definite completion exactly when G is portal. Okay? So if you think back to the example that we had before, um, let's see, let me pull it out here. And if I can find it.
this example. The graph in this case is simply a four cycle, and that's not portable, and that was in some sense the source of the problem. Okay. Let me uh, take a moment to just give you a quick idea of the proof of the, of the portal theorem, because it's sort of a model for quite a number of other theorems. Okay? So I've got to do two things. I've got to show you that uh, any portal graph works. If I have a portal graph and I'm partial positive definite, I need to know there's a positive definite completion. And then I need to somehow convince you that if the graph is not portal, that there exists data that's partial positive definite that has no positive definite completion. And here's what happens. First of all, if you give me any portal graph at all, then it's possible to uh, order that the missing edges, the edges that aren't there, in such a way that if I add them one at a time in the specified, in the indicated order, that I'll maintain cordiality. In other words, every new graph I produce will be cordial. So there's a special ordering of the missing edges. Now it turns out that such an ordering is not unique, but it is fairly rare among all orderings. I have to be careful to order things properly. But there's always more than one ordering. Okay. Now, associated with the addition of each new edge, if the graph was portal, it turns out that there's just, there's just one new clique that's completed uh, in the graph. Okay? So, associated with the addition of each new edge, I will have exactly a one variable type problem, a problem studied by Berg, in fact. Each time uh, will we'll, uh, only require me to solve a problem like this in order to say partial positive definite, then I know that I can do so, and so now I can complete algorithmically one entry at a time by picking the right order, solving a, a simple problem, and then continuing. Okay? So that's sort of a computer science proof, if you will, that cordiality is sufficient. On the other hand, uh, what about necessity? Well, uh, remember that positive definiteness is a property that's inherited by, sub by principal submatrices. And so if I have a uh, partial positive definite matrix, in order for it to be completable to a positive definite matrix, it must be that every principal submatrix is completable. Well, if my graph is not portal, there has to be a long cycle somewhere in the graph. Okay? And for every long cycle, I can give a counterexample, very much like the 4x4 four four example that I had uh, earlier, and then I can embed that in, in the entire data in a fairly simple way, and for any non portal graph, show that, that there's uh, non completed data. Okay? And, uh, well, that's uh, similar to a lot of proofs in this business now. So it's worth, it's worth keeping that strategy in mind. Now, if you think back to the, the work of Dim and Gokberg, they had a couple of other conclusions about uh, completions, about positive definite completions, having to do with determinant maximizing positive definite completions. And it turns out that those conclusions have absolutely nothing to do with the pattern. They only have to do with the fact that there exist positive definite completions. Okay? So we were also able to show that if you give me a partial positive definite matrix that has positive definite completions, okay, that's all we need to know, then I can draw two conclusions exactly like Dim and Gottberg chose, uh, exactly like the conclusions of Dim and Gottberg in the Bandit case. First of all, again, there's a unique completion with maximum determinant among all the positive definite completions. And this is the only one uh, the only positive definite completion, in fact, the only completion at all, it turns out, whose inverse has zeros in all the positions that correspond to unspecified entries in the original partial matrix. Okay? So the determinant maximizing value is unique, and he's characterized by having zeros in his inverse in all the right places. Okay? So those are the same conclusions of Dim and Gottberg, and, and my claim is that they only depend on the existence of positive definite completions, not 
not, not at all on patterns. Let me give you a quick idea of the proof here, uh, because this seems to still be the only proof, uh, and we would like to generalize this in certain ways to, to the infinite dimensional case. In fact, a lot, of, a lot of what I've said so far carries over to the infinite dimensional case if you set things up right. Uh, but so far, nobody has an analog of this uh, determining, maximizing, completion uh, in the infinite dimensional case, except for quarter patterns, even though it's true for all patterns in, in the finite dimensional case. So here's the idea. So I've got this partial positive definite matrix. I'm assuming it has positive definite completions. And so now let's consider the set of all positive semi-definite completions. So I'm going to close up the set uh, of positive definite completions and, and throw in all the semi-definite completions. Now, I claim that this set is compact. In fact, it's also convex. The reason it's compact is, uh, first of all, I've closed it up by throwing in semi-definite completions. And secondly, no, no entry can be too large because the diagonal entries are specified. So every 2 by 2 principal submatrix is going to have to be positive definite, positive semi-definite. And since the diagonal entries are specified, the off-diagonal entries cannot be too big. Okay? Uh, just by the determinant of 2 by 2 principal submatrices. Okay, now the determinant is a nice continuous function. And so somewhere in this set of semi-definite completions, the maximum determinant is obtained by Weierstrass's theorem because I've got a continuous function that I'm maximizing on a compact set. Okay? Now, it must be in the interior of my set, I should say the relative interior, because I'm looking uh, just in the space of the specified, uh, I'm sorry, of the unspecified entries. So this determinant maximizing completion must be at a positive definite matrix of my set. And so uh, I can apply now all the theory about optimization that might be brought to bear. And one very important fact is that the determinant function is actually a strictly log concave function over the positive definite matrices, a very handy fact. So that means that with regard to optimization, the determinant behaves exactly like a strictly concave function. So in particular, if I'm maximizing, that means there will be a unique maximum among the positive definite completions. Okay? And that maximum will uh, occur, as I said, in the interior. And so uh, it will be at a unique critical point. Now, what does it mean to be a critical point uh, of the uh, determinant function as a function of the unspecified entries? Well, it means that if I differentiate the determinant with respect to any unspecified entries, uh, I should get zero. And what is the derivative of the determinant with respect to an entry? Well, it's essentially a cofactor, okay, uh, divided by, uh, let's see, it's this cofactor divided by the determinant of the matrix. This is the inverse entry. Well, I'm sorry. Let me step back a minute. If I differentiate the determinant with respect to an entry, I essentially get a cofactor, and that cofactor is the numerator of the inverse entry by the uh, cofactor formula for the inverse. And so to be at a critical point, that means I must have a zero entry in the inverse. Okay? And that explains the, the, the zero pattern claim that I made. And it also explains the uniqueness because of the uh, strict concavity that's uh, a bit work here. And that's a very finite dimensional proof and uh, it's an interesting challenge to try to uh, say something something analogous in different dimensions. Okay. Now, that's the basic theory, but what I'd like to do next is explain uh, something, some very specific things about finding uh, determinant maximizing positive definite completions, at least in the chordal case. And to do that, I need to inflict a little more graph theory on you, but I suppose that here that's not a problem, uh, since people know most things. So let me just give you a couple of reminders. A tree is nothing other than a minimally connected, undirected graph. OK? 
Okay, so a tree looks like this. And two very important properties of trees are the following. First of all, if I pick any two vertices in a tree, then there's a unique path joining them, a unique shortest path. Okay? And secondly, uh, trees play an important role in the analysis of all connected graphs because any connected graph has a spanning tree. Okay? Uh, and a spanning tree is nothing other than a subset of the edges that cover all the vertices in front of the tree. Okay? It's sort of a skeleton. Yeah. It's a paper the uh, line I line this. Oh, you want to see it again? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You mean the new circuit? Sorry. Try it? There, there, there. Yeah. 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 What is it? Oh, you, you <laughs> oh I see. Sorry. Very small print. <laughs> Sorry about that. Circuit. Okay. So we know what trees are and a couple of important facts about trees. Now, um, there's another important structural feature of a chordal graph, and I'm just going to take a moment to describe that. So suppose you give me any undirected graph G, and I write down a list of all the maximal cliques in G. Now it turns out that when G is chordal, uh, there will be at most something like n minus 1 maximal cliques. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is form a new graph from these maximal cleaves, and it will simply be the intersection graph of these guys considered as vertex sets. So the vertices of my new graph will be just uh, vertices that correspond to the maximal cleaves. And I'll have an edge between two cleaves exactly when the vertex sets intersect. Okay, I guess this should be not the empty set. And so this is the so-called cleat graph of the original graph G. I simply take the intersection graph of the maximum cleats. Okay, now, uh, what I'm going to look for is a spanning tree of this cleat intersection graph that has a certain property called the intersection property, which I'll describe on the next transparency. And it turns out that the original graph G is portal if and only if there exists a spanning tree of G, uh, I'm sorry, spanning tree of the complete intersection graph that has this uh, intersection property. So this characterizes chordality, and it's this special spanning tree of the complete intersection graph that, uh, that I want to look at. Now it turns out that the intersections of these adjacent ma maximal cliques are are vertex separators in the original graph, which I, I won't make a lot of use of, so don't worry too much about it. Somehow characterizes portal graphs also. And it's the following. So uh, if I take any two cliques uh, at all and I look at their intersection, that has to lie in uh, any clique along the unique path in T joining these two cliques. So I've got CI and CJ, I look at any clique along the way in this spanning tree, and it has to contain the intersection between CI and CJ. Okay? Here's a simple example. Uh, this corresponds to a uh, five-banded pattern, which is portal. Here's the graph indicated in blue. Okay? And there are three maximal cleats, C1, C2, and C3 here outlined in red. And here's the cleat intersection graph. Every, every pair of these cleats intersects. So the cleat intersection graph in this case is unique. I'm sorry, this is complete. And uh, how do I know that I have this special spanning tree? Well, this turns out to be the special spanning tree. Okay, C1 to C2, C2 to C3, and that one works, it has this intersection property because the intersection of C1 and C3, two guys uh, far apart in the tree, 
uh, is contained in C2. Okay? Uh, the intersection of C1 and C3 is just vertex 3, and that's contained in C2. Uh, now, it shouldn't be any surprise that I have this tree-like property for portal grass, because think of the way that I said you can build them up via cleats. I did that exactly the, in the way that I would build up a tree from edges. Okay, so portal graphs have, have some sort of tree-like property. Okay. Now, uh, I, need to, I need to define the notion of a G-regular partial matrix. So, uh, suppose I have a portal graph G and I have this special cleat tree for G and it's a, it's a standing tree of this cleat intersection graph of C1 and Cn. Now, suppose I have an n by n partial matrix or ordinary matrix, it doesn't matter in this case. And suppose I look at the principal submatrices corresponding to uh, uh, maximal cleats and intersections of maximal cleats associated with edges in this uh, special tree T, which is way up there, uh, then it turns out that, G, that what I, the condition I need is that, that uh, the all the principal minors associated with these guys should be invertible. Okay? So I need those determinants to be non-zero. And then I say that the matrix A is G regular, and that's relative to this portal graph G. And uh, let me just mention again that these guys are, are minimal vertex separators in the graph of G. Okay. So now I have the same setup. I have a portal graph G. And now let's suppose I have a G regular partial matrix. And I'm going to assume that I don't necessarily have symmetry now, but I'm combinatorially symmetric. That's all this really depends on. Um, and in fact, the entries could, could themselves be operators in this case. Then I get a unique completion of A whose inverse has zeros in the correct places. That is, the graph of the inverse is contained in this graph G. Okay? Um, so I get a unique completion with zeros in the right places if I'm G regular in the graph is portal. Okay? Now, if I throw away any of those assumptions, there's a problem. So, so that's, that's exactly what's important. So let me just review here. I've got a partial matrix. I've got an underlying portal graph. And I've got a certain regularity condition involving certain minors being invertible. And my claim is that I need that regularity condition so, so we can't do it later. Now, let me just mention here very quickly. So this, this uh, I now have this uh, partial matrix A. I look at this special completion that I claim exists. Then its determinant turns out to be the following. It's just the product of the principal minors associated with the maximum cleats divided by the product of the principal minors associated with these intersections of maximal cleats uh, associated with edges of the tree. So this determinant has a very nice formula. And uh, this is all true in a very general setting. Okay? I don't have to worry about positive depth unless I get this, I get this nice formula. And by the way, uh, one could stop off here and uh, do quite a bit about determinental inequalities just from this uh, portal theory. So I, I think I won't do that in view of the time, but uh, this, is, this is sort of a takeoff point where one could talk a lot about getting determinental inequalities out of this stuff. OK. So now, let me return to my situation. and. So we know that uh, if I've got a portal graph and a certain regularity condition, then there's a unique completion that has zeros in the inverse. And zeros in the inverse have some, has something to do with the special determinant of maximizing completion in the positive definite case. So how can I, how can I write down this nice completion? Well, uh, again, I have the same setup. 
And let's suppose I take uh, something that's not an edge of G, that is, uh, something that corresponds to an unspecified entry in A. Okay? Now I want to tell you exactly how to calculate the indeed completion. So AIJ is unspecified, so uh, I lies in some clique and J lies in some other clique. Now in this spanning tree T, there's a unique path between the clique that contains I and the clique that contains J. And if I simply write down, here's the magic formula, all of the stuff here is specified. So I take the part of A that lies in row I and corresponds to the set D1, where the Ds are defined as intersections of these consecutive cleats along this path. Then I multiply by the inverse of a certain principal submatrix that I know about my hypothesis is invertible because of the regularity condition. Then I multiply by another specified piece of A, another inverse that I know is that I know exists, and so forth, until I come out the other end and get a part of a column of A. And this is exactly a formula for the entry A of J in order to have a special zero to the inverse completion. That leaves just one, one question left, and that is, what are the non-zero, or the possibly non-zero, entries in the inverse matrix for this special uh, completion, okay? And there's, again, a really nice formula for the inverse here, to, to say what the non-zero entries are. And so, again, I've got the same set, a the graph, partial matrix, um, the graph of the partial matrix is the given of the graph G, and I've got uh, G regularity. And now let me denote by A hat the special completion of A that has zeros in its inverse in its correct places. And now what I'm going to show is how to calculate that inverse in a simple way. And to do that, I need a little bit of notation. I'll let B sub alpha be the following. Uh, it's simply the uh, matrix I get by taking the inverse of the alpha submatrix of A and putting that inverse in the alpha positions of the new matrix and then surrounding it with zeros. Okay? And I'll have an example in a moment. Okay? So B sub alpha just means a certain inverse bordered by a bunch of zeros in the right way. And then the inverse of A hat, in other words, the inverse of the special completion, is simply the sum of the B alphas that correspond to the maximal pleats in G. Okay? And by the way, we know all those inverses exist. And then minus the sum of the B betas, where the betas correspond to the minimal separators, or those intersections of maximal pleats associated with the, with the tree T. Okay? Now, some of these B betas may occur more than once. I might have the same one occur more than once, but that doesn't pose a problem. Okay? So here's exactly what this, what this inverse looks like. And let me just give a simple example to sort of indicate what's going on here. Okay. So let's suppose I have this partial matrix and these unspecified parts. So I've got two maximal cleats, this one and this one, and they overlap here. And now, my formula for the uh, completing entries in order to get zeros in the inverse is simply the following. X has to be this, Y has to be this, okay? All in terms of specified data. And then the inverse looks like this. I take this block, this maximal clique, I invert uh, the matrix that lies there, I put the inverse here, I border with zeros in the correct way, I invert this guy, put the inverse here, border with zeros in the correct way. Now I have to correct by inverting this guy, putting the inverse here, bordering with zeros, and all of this adds up exactly to the inverse of the special. 
Now, it may not be so apparent, but this, this formula is enormously handy in proving things about uh, conclusion problems. So, in some of the more recent problems, um, we have uh, made great use of that. Um, okay, so maybe I should stop off here a moment and just say a couple of things. So, let me, let me go back to this formula. So here, notice what's happened. I've got, I've got something associated with maximal cliques, and then I correct by subtracting something associated with minimal separators. In that determinental formula for this special uh, uh, completion, I had a product of principal minors associated with max maximal cliques divided by product of principal minors associated with minimal separators. So the same kind of thing, there, that is a multiplicative version, this is an additive version, and that same kind of formula keeps popping up in, in uh, all of this stuff. And here's another example of how it pops up. Um, there's a nice formula for inertia of completions. Same kind of setup. If I take this uh, special completion, then its inertia will be, again, a sum of inertias associated with maximal cliques minus the sum of inertias associated with minimal separators, okay? Where inertia is just a list of the uh, number of positive, negative, and zero eigenvalues of the given matrix. So, uh, same kind of formula now for inertias with the special population. So, um, there's a lot that can be said here along those lines. Yeah. Take a break now. Oh, no, not now. Well, it's probably not a bad spot. Maybe I will do one more thing and then and then we'll take a break. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't want to, don't want to run everybody into the ground. <laughs> How's your head? <laughs> Gosh, it feels better. I thought. <laughs> So, okay, so now I've given you a pretty good idea of what happens in the portal case and a few things that don't depend on portality, but um, let me see what, what can be said beyond the portal case, okay? So, um, the general problem is the following. You give me any old graph and I'd like to know what are the conditions on the specified entry that determine whether or not a partial positive definite matrix with that graph has a positive definite completion. So we now understand this rather fully for portal graphs. That's a really nice case. I don't need to know anything beyond partial positive definiteness. But what about other graphs? Now, our general theory that I mentioned at the beginning says there is a finite list of conditions for any graph because positive definiteness is certainly a real polynomial describable condition. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to say what the conditions are. In fact, in general, it's not easy to say what the conditions are. So what I'd like to do now is describe what happens in the case when the graph is about as non-portal as possible, namely one long cycle. Okay? This is clearly not a portal graph. Anymore. It's very much non-portal. And for the moment, I'll just talk about the case of real data. So I've got a full cycle, uh, real data, and partial positive definite. Now, if I number things properly, then uh, my partial matrix looks like this. I, the diagonal entry, diagonal is specified as usual, and then I have a cycle of data, assuming that I number things consecutively around the cycle. And this is some work. Now, since the diagonal entries are specified, I can perform a diagonal congruence on this matrix. I don't change the role of specified and unspecified entries, and I can replace all the diagonal entries by ones. So with that pre-processing, I can assume that my partial matrix looks like this, okay? Ones on the diagonal, 
And then the specified off-diagonal entries will have to all be strictly less than 1 uh, in absolute value because I'm partial positive definite. And that simply means that uh, I can write those off-diagonal entries as cosines of angles that lie strictly between 0 and pi. Okay? So these guys are less than 1 in absolute value. And so I can think of them as cosines of angles, and I can take those angles to lie between 0 and pi. Okay? Now, something interesting happens here, and that is that the description of when there's a completion uh, depends not at all on the order of the thetas around the cycle. It only depends on the numerical order of the phase. It's amazing, but uh, there is a, is a sort of after-the-fact explanation. So in any event, let me suppose that I renumber the thetas so that they're in numerical, descending numerical order. Remember, they lie between 0 and 5. And then the theorem is the following. Uh, such an object has a positive definite completion exactly when I have a certain condition on the thetas, and that condition is the following. I think of writing the thetas, well, here they are, in a list this way, and I parse my list after every odd number theta. So after theta 1, after theta 3, after theta 5, and so on. And each time I parse the list and put the first odd number of thetas on the left, and the rest of the thetas on the right, and put in a fudge factor of, of this amount, I should have a strict inequality. And this list of inequalities, about n over 2 inequalities, is necessary and sufficient that that guy have a positive definite completion. And these are what we refer to as the, the cycle conditions for um, a, a cycle of data for the positive definite completion problem. Okay. So what that means is now that if I have any old graph at all, I have a new necessary condition for completability. Anytime I see a cycle in that graph, then the data associated with the cycle can better uh, satisfy these, these cycle conditions. And in fact, you can prove that you only need to look at the minimum cycles in a graph. That's, that's enough. So let me stop there a moment and we'll take a break. So now we know a little something beyond the pillow. We'll all catch our breath. And... Is this mine? Is this mine? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. That's uh, soon to appear in the round for the applications. And here's the idea. So if you uh, don't know exactly uh, how to get a positive definite completion or a positive semi-definite completion, what should you do? Well, you cheat a little bit, okay? And here's the way we, we cheat in order to get started. I simply take my partial matrix and I add a big enough scalar to the diagonal, uh, to every diagonal entry, to ensure that there are positive definite completions. And one way to do that is the following. I could take the zero completion here, and then I could simply make alpha big enough so that this guy is diagonally dominant, say. Okay? So I simply make a new problem with alpha uh, in which I know there are positive definite completions. Now, uh, pick some order for the unspecified entries. Okay, so I'm going to fix an order of the unspecified entries. Uh, actually, uh, uh, theoretically, any order will do, but in fact, some orders are better than others that, that somehow take advantage of cordiality. Uh, but uh, for this discussion, just fix any old order. And now what I do is the following. I, I take the completion that I knew I had here, okay, and I free up one of the uh, one of the formerly unspecified entries, uh, the first one in this order, 
And for that new problem, in which I have just one unspecified entry and all the other entries corresponding to a completion of this, uh, I solve a one variable determinant maximization problem. And that's quite easy. easy. We know how to do that. We have nice formulas that tell you how to solve that problem. So now, once I've done that, I go to the next uh, entry in my order. I now keep the, the entry that I've calculated here, make a new entry unspecified, solve the one variable problem, put that solution in, go to the next entry, uh, put uh, uh, solve the one variable problem, put the entry in, and so forth. Okay? Now, after I've gone through all the entries once, and I have a new completion, I can calculate the uh, minimum eigenvalue of that completed matrix, it will be positive. And I can decrease the value of alpha somewhat. Okay? So I pick a new value, say beta, which is less than alpha, and I do the same thing again. Okay? I now solve a sequence of uh, one variable problems associated with my ordering of the unspecified entry, and I come down here and I decrease a little bit more. And I continue this process. Now, one of two things will happen. Either, eventually, I'll get down to the point at which uh, I can take beta to be zero, in which case I know that I have positive semi-definite completions. And then if I continue this process, it will provably converge to the determinant maximizing uh, positive semi-definite completion, possibly positive definite. Or the other possibility is that this process will converge so that I uh, cannot decrease the value of data anymore. And if data has to be positive, then I know that I have no positive semi-definite completions. Okay? So it's possible to prove all of these things. Now, in fact, when there exist positive definite completions, this process seems to converge remarkably rapidly, and we don't know what makes it converge so rapidly. Um, in about three passes of this process, we'll typically find a positive definite completion if there is one, and independent of the size of the matrix. So, of course, you have to do more work for bigger matrices to, to make a pass, but, but uh, in fact, the, the uh, number of passes seems not to depend on the size of the matrix. So this is one algorithm which seems to work uh, pretty well in practice and at least provably converges. Uh, and it seems to do especially well uh, if you start far away from the solution. So, I mean, it's not that it does badly if you start close, but I mean, it seems to move very quickly in the right direction. Okay, so that's one algorithm. Let, let me mention another. I'm sorry. You need a clean time. <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, work with this uh, heavy currency again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's another idea that actually solves a more general problem. And the idea is the following. Um, the, the positive semi-definite matrices, of course, form a cone, and in particular, a nice convex set in matrix space. And, and the set of all completions of our matrix A, uh, which is an affine uh, space in, in matrix space, uh, is, is, a, is again a convex set. Okay? And the completion problem we can think of as just a problem of deciding whether these two intersect, whether the cone of positive semi-definites and the convex set of, of uh, completions uh, actually intersect. So I can view this as a convex set intersection problem. Um, and furthermore, if, if they don't intersect, I could ask the question of how close uh, these two sets come. How close can I get to a positive definite completion if I can't actually get to one? Okay? So in that sense, this is going to be a little more general. So let me now describe an algorithm that actually solves that problem. Uh, and again, uh, provably converges, although this uh, isn't necessarily very fast, but uh, at least it solves a more general problem. 
So, uh, at my partial permission matrix, everything's going to be with respect to the Frobenius norm. And remember now that if I have an ordinary permission matrix B, I can always uniquely decompose it into its positive semi-definite part and negative semi-definite part in such a way that the uh, Frobenius inner product of uh, the two parts is zero. And the way that I get these is the following. Uh, for this one, I simply take a spectral decomposition of B, and then I set all the negative eigenvalues equal to zero, and I get B plus. I keep the same unitary similarity. And for this one, I set all the positive eigenvalues equal to zero, leaving a negative semi-definite matrix. Okay? So there's this unique decomposition of an arbitrary permission matrix. And now, the claim is the following. Among all the permission completions of the partial matrix A, the ones that are nearest to the positive semi-definites are exactly the ones for which uh, B minus has zeros in all the unspecified positions of A. Okay? So imagine that I uh, look at uh, this decomposition of each completion and the completion that's nearest, or the completions that are nearest uh, to the positive semi-definites are exactly the ones for which the negative semi-definite part has zeros in the unspecified positions of A. Okay? Now, that's a nice enough theorem, but in fact it suggests an algorithm. And here's that algorithm. So I take and I start with any permission completion of A at all. I write the B in this special form, and by the way, that's not hard to calculate, it's just one eigenvalue calculation. And then what I do is the following. I take B minus that's been calculated, and I replace it with the matrix that I get by changing all the specified positions in B minus to zeros. So I wanted them to be zero, so I made them zero. Okay? Well, now I get a new matrix, uh, a new B, uh, that I get by keeping the same B plus and replacing B minus by this uh, altered B minus. Now notice what happens. This guy is still a completion of the original matrix because the only entries that I've changed are the unspecified entries in this matrix. And so I've only changed the unspecified entries in the sum, and so I've got a new completion. Well, so I do this. The theorem is that this process actually converges, and it can only converge to a matrix in which B minus has zeros in the right places, but by the theorem, that's a completion that's nearest to the positive semi-definites. Okay? And the reason it converges is because you can prove this inequality and then use some, uh, some general convergence theory uh, together with that in order to, uh, to show that we get convergence in this algorithm. So that actually produces a, a completion that's nearest to the positive semi-definites. Now, uh, let me just very quickly mention that there's also some uh, optimization approaches to this problem, and I won't, let me not give any details, but some, using some general optimization machinery. So far, I've sort of had matrix-oriented algorithms, but you can also use some uh, uh, ideas based on semi-definite programming to solve this problem, and in fact, to solve weighted versions of this problem. And this seems to work quite well when you're near a solution uh, because there's, a, there's an underlying Newton's type, Newton type method that work and so if you're near enough to a solution you'll actually get quadratic convergence. So uh, it's worth keeping in mind that there are some uh, optimization based numerical approaches also. Okay, so what I think I'd like to spend the rest, so, so that's the end of the positive definite story for now. Modulo, lots of things that I didn't mention but uh, but gave some allusion to. And so what I'd like to do now uh, is just mention briefly uh, 
some work on completion problems for other classes of matrices. Okay? And uh, I'll see how far I can get uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, one of the simplest uh, variations is the case of distance matrices. And remember that a distance matrix is simply the following. Uh, you give me several points in, uh, in some space, say Rn or Cn or whatever you like, then I can form a, a distance matrix from those points in the following way. I simply calculate the Euclidean distance from point Pi to Pj. Here it is. And I make that the uh, Ij entry of my distance matrix. So this is going to be a matrix with zeros on the diagonal, non-negative off-diagonal entries, and it will be symmetric. Okay? And by the way, this leads to another uh, one of the nice applications of completions, completion theory, and that has to do with distance matrices of the atoms and molecule. Uh, and there's a whole nice, uh, nice subject there. Okay, so what's the theory from, from a matrix point of view? Well, uh, things are entirely analogous to the positive definite case. Okay. Uh, so basically, everything that I've told you about the positive definite case, there is a, an analogous theorem in the distance matrix case. So suppose now I have a partial distance matrix, okay, and I want to know if it has a distance <coughs> matrix completion. Well. Partial distance matrix means the obvious thing. All the fully specified principal submatrices are themselves distance matrices. And I'd like to know when I have a completion to a distance matrix. Again, this, there, is a, there is always a, uh, there, there are conditions on the data, because this is a real polynomial to describe the problem. And uh, again, there's a portal theorem. So if the graph of the specified entries is, is portal, then I always get a uh, distance matrix completion. Uh, and in fact, you might wonder uh, what dimension the points can be placed in, and it will always be the maximum dimension uh, of, the, uh, of the space corresponding to the, to the uh, uh, fully specified principal submatrices. So we can say something about the dimension. Now, again, there are, there's a cycle condition. If my data forms a cycle, then uh, what does it mean for a cycle to be a cycle of distances? Well, there's a sort of an, an analog of the triangle inequality called the polygonal inequality. Here it is. And for this to have a completion to a distance matrix, I need exactly this condition. And again, uh, once I know that cycle condition, there's a class of graphs for which being a partial distance matrix plus satisfying the cycle condition uh, ensures that there's a completion, and that class of graphs is exactly the same as in the positive definite case. So things are very analogous for uh, distance matrices. Now, uh, let me go to some other classes. Uh, I'll just mention them here. Probably they're familiar to most everyone here. Let me just very quickly mention them. They're the N matrices that I've already talked about. They're the matrices with this sign pattern, invertible, and uh, entry-wise non-negative inverse. And they're the inverses of such matrices. Distance matrices I just mentioned. Uh, doubly non-negative matrices are ones that are positive definite. Uh, and entry-wise non-negative. Completely positive matrices are ones that are not only positive semi-definite, but they can actually be written as BB transpose with B entry-wise non-negative. Okay, and P matrices are just real matrices, all of whose principal minors are positive, and totally positive matrices, I think I mentioned, the ones we call all minors, uh, all minors non, well, if I say totally positive, I should say all minors positive, but totally non negative means all minors non negative. Okay, so those are some, 
sort of familiar classes of matrices. And, uh, okay. Now let me mention a little bit more about graph theory. So I think we talked about complete sum of graphs before. Uh, so uh, let's see. If I have uh, two graphs, any two graphs, and they both have a common clique, if I identify the two graphs along the common clique, so let's see, if I take, let's see, this guy and this guy and identify them with this clique, I get a new graph here. And so that's what we call clique summing. And, and now I want to talk about special chordal graphs, ones in which uh, I build them up from cliques as I did before, except now I'm going to limit the sizes of the intersections of, of cliques as I build things up. So I'll call something k chordal if the maximum of the cardinalities of the intersections of two different maximal cliques is at most k. So if I think of building up by, by clique summing, I only uh, clique sum graphs along cliques that are no bigger than size k. Okay? So I guess this is an example of a two chordal graph. So here's a clique, I clique sum it with this along a, an edge, and then I clique sum the result with this along a vertex, and with this along an edge, and this along an edge, and so forth. So that's an example of a two chordal graph. Okay, so now let's see. Let's talk about n matrices and inverse n matrices. And here, something sort of interesting and uninteresting. So I could ask about completion problems for M matrices. Suppose I have a partial M matrix. I simply mean that every fully specified principal submatrix is itself an M matrix. Again, the property of being an M matrix is inherited by principal submatrices. So in order to have an M matrix completion, I must be a partial M matrix. But here's already in a very small case a rather troubling example. Here's a partial n matrix because this is an n matrix, this is an n matrix. The graph is nice and portal. In fact, it's one portal because the overlap is just a single vertex. And yet, this, this partial matrix has no n matrix completion. It's easy to see that. You could do a calculation uh, by putting sort of arbitrary non positive entries here. But it's very simple to see that that has no n matrix completion using ideas of diagonal dominance. And the reason for that is there's a simple theorem. And that is if I have any partial n matrix, I don't care whether the whether the combinatorial is symmetric, I don't care whether the graph is choral or not, if I have any partial n matrix, then such a thing has an n matrix completion if and only if the completion in which I put zeros in all the unspecified positions works. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, as many of you know, in n matrices, there's an underlying diagonal dominance. And the smaller the entries I put here, the better chance I have of having that under underlying diagonal dominance. So if zero doesn't work, then nothing will work. And so I only need to check the zero completion. Now, think about this for a moment. Uh, again, M matrices have the property that uh, as long as I have this. Well, if I, if I write down this zero completion, then the leading principal minors I can view as polynomials in the specified entries. Okay? And I need all of those polynomials to be positive. So this is a realization of what I said about real polynomially describable in the beginning. 
the conditions for an M matrix completion are just that the polynomials that I get in this way all be positive. And those are polynomials in the specified entries. Okay? So here's an example in which we can actually get the, the polynomials, uh, actually get those polynomial conditions very easily. And it's the only example I know in which there's an easy solution to the, to the problem that I stated at the beginning of getting uh, polynomial conditions for, for any graph. Okay? So the case of N matrices is interesting in that uh, it's an example where you can get those conditions, but it's sort of uninteresting in that the problem is too easy. Okay. Um, so let me talk about inverse N matrices instead. Okay, so now, now I'll ask the, the uh, question about inverse N matrices. And now I want to uh, identify one portal graphs. Okay, so here's an example of a one portal graph. I just do clean sign uh, only along vertices. And so now uh, I'm always going to be involved with a simple case in which I have whatever I've already done overlapping a new clean in just one entry. Okay? So this is the simple situation I'll be uh, faced with. And if I want the zeros in the inverse completion of something that looks like this, then what I do is very simple. Um, I look at the entries that are here and the entries that are here. And oh, by the way, I can always normalize so that this entry is 1. And uh, if I take the outer product of this vector and this vector and put that here and similarly down here, then I get the exactly the zeros in the inverse completion. That's the formula that I mentioned before. Okay? So it's very easy in this case to see what the zeros in the inverse completion is. Okay. And so what you can show based on that idea. Oh, let's see, I guess I think I've got something in there. Okay. Maybe. So let me just let me just say, let me, let me go back here. So why did I worry about all of this? Well, um, suppose I have now an inverse M matrix here and an inverse M matrix here. And I write down this zeros in the inverse completion. Well, I will then have an entry-wise non-negative matrix, because this is non-negative, this is non-negative. And since I've got an outer product here, this will be non-negative, and this will be non-negative. So I have an entry-wise non-negative matrix. By that inverse formula that I talked about uh, shortly before we took the break, the inverse of this matrix will be what? I'll take the inverse of this, which will have the n matrix pattern. Then I'll overlay the inverse of this, which will have the n matrix pattern. And then I'll subtract the inverse of this. And it turns out that when I do that subtraction, I'll be OK. I'll still get a positive entry in this position. And I'll get zeros out here. So the inverse of this, this matrix will be positive on the diagonal, non-positive off the diagonal, in fact, lots of zeros. And so the matrix that I'll have will, in fact, be the inverse of an M matrix. Okay? So what that means is that if my graph looks like this, if it's one portal, and all of these cliques correspond to inverse N matrices, then there will be an inverse N matrix completion. Okay? And I simply do it by uh, induction worked on this so far with so many cliques and then I probably want to complete and complete on this zeros in the inverse one. Okay. Uh, so that's intended to justify this theorem. being 
partial inverse M is not enough for an inverse M completion. And here's a two chordal case, overlap with two. This is a partial inverse M matrix, and yet you can show there's no inverse M matrix completion. And so the theorem one gets out of that by sort of glorifying these examples a bit. Is that if I have an undirected graph G and I want to know what it takes in order that every partial inverse M matrix uh, with graph G has an inverse M matrix completion, then that happens exactly when G is one quarter. Okay? So this is the analog of the quarter result in the positive definite case. Okay? And as I said, the sufficiency uses that inverse formula. And that's it's a very nice application. Okay, so that's the basic result for inverse N matrices. Now, again, one ought to ask the question, well, is there a cycle result? And what are the graphs and all these things? And you can say quite a bit, uh, although we still don't quite know what happens in the general non-symmetric inverse N case with a cycle, but we have a good guess. Uh, okay, now, what you can show is the following. If you're going to be inverse M, inverse M is an inherited property, and so uh, it turns out that if I have this submatrix, not principal, its determinant will always be non-positive. That means I will always get this kind of condition, and if I concatenate this condition, I'll get a path product, a so-called path product condition. In other words, if I take any path and take the product of the entries along that path, it's always dominated by the, uh, the entry associated with the edge uh, corresponding to that path. Okay? So this is always true for any inverse end matrix. And from that, one can deduce the following. If I have a cycle, well, here's a path, and that path has to be less than or equal to this entry. Here's a path that has to be less than or equal to this entry. And so if I multiply through, I get that any cycle product uh, has to be less than or equal to this uh, product of entries. So if I take the cycle this way, that has to be less than or equal to this time this. I take the cycle this way, that has to be less than or equal to this time this. Okay? So this cycle condition is a necessary condition for a completion to an inverse end matrix. Okay? And we believe that is sufficient in general, but we can only prove that it's sufficient uh, in the symmetric case. So, uh, here's the theorem. It, it, so, in the symmetric case, my cycle condition becomes uh, something very simple, uh, which I've indicated there. And, oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is it. This is the cycle condition in the symmetric case. And it turns out that that, uh, that condition is necessary and sufficient for completion to a <coughs> symmetric inverse M matrix. Uh, I guess I should have written symmetric there, but in fact it's necessary and sufficient for completion to a symmetric inverse M matrix, uh, given that the data along the cycle is symmetric. But in the non-symmetric case, it's not clear. So that's more or less where things stand at the moment. And let me let me do two more things. I think in view of the time, uh, let me talk about uh, completely positive and doubly non-negative completions, and then let me say a little bit about minimum rank completions because that's a, a little bit different. Let's talk about completely positive. So remember, completely positive means that a matrix is not only positive semi-definite, but it can actually be written 
in the form D B transpose with D entrywise non negative. And so now, suppose I have a partial completely positive matrix. With the given graph, I can again ask the question, uh, what do I need to know about the graph in order that, that's, uh, that that ensures uh, completely positive completion? And the answer, as in the uh, inverse end matrix case, is that the graph be one portal. Okay? And what you need to do is, as usual, rule out with examples, rule out other kinds of graphs. Okay? So you can rule out two or more portal, and you can rule out cycles. And then again, I need to, I need to consider this case where I have an overlap of one and two cleats. And I take this special completion in which I take the outer product of this vector and this vector and put it here. And again, using the inverse formula, or actually using other things will work as well, you can show that that gives a completion. And in fact, here, it's, um, it's actually simpler to use some other ideas. Let me just, let me just indicate that. So let's suppose I have this basic case. And let's suppose that this matrix is completely positive, this matrix is completely positive, and I want to show that there's a completely positive completion. In fact, I, as I indicated, that completion is going to be this outer product here and down here. Now, since A is completely positive, then uh, A is... Uh, can be written as a sum of outer products of non-negative vectors. Similarly for B, B can be written as a sum of outer products of non-negative vectors. And now, uh, what I'm going to do is take these vectors and I'm going to combine them in the following way. Now, let me partition these vectors so that I have a scalar at the bottom and these vectors so that I have a scalar at the top. And now, I'll simply uh, combine these in the following way. I'll make the bigger vector C corresponding to the pair AI and BJ by putting up here the scalar, this scalar times, uh, let's see, I got this right. Yes, this, this scalar times this vector here, then the product of the scalars here in the middle, and then this scalar times this vector down here. Okay, so that's how I did C. Any, any particular reason to change the, uh, the first complement of the yes. instead of AI1 times BJ1? Use the PJ uh, because this is a scalar and this is a vector. That's all. Just the nicety of multiplying having the scalar on the left. That's all. Uh, those two are scalars. Yeah. So this is scalar times vector. This is scalar times vector. And this is scalar times scalar. Okay. Now, um, now if I write down this matrix, so so. This is a bunch of, uh, of uh, non-negative vectors. So if I take the sum of their outer products, then that's a CP matrix. And furthermore, I claim that it's actually a CP completion of our original matrix. To say that it's a completion, I just need to verify that this matrix agrees with M in these positions and in these positions. Okay? And that's an easy calculation to carry out because since I have a 1 here, then, uh, uh, well, anyway, it's not, not too hard to carry out the calculation. What, what do I get up here? Well, I get the uh, sum of the outer products of these vectors with themselves. And because, let's see, 
because of the one, these guys add up to, uh, let me be careful. Well, because of the one, uh, the sum of these outer products uh, will actually give me A. Now, you have to do a little calculating to see that, but it's, it's true. Okay, so that's the proof of sufficiency in that case. Now, well, and that, that gives me the one quarter result. And by the way, there's a corresponding one quarter result for doubly non negative matrices. Okay. Now, what about cycle conditions? Certainly, 
talk to you about that if you like. Um, but this, this problem, the problem of minimum rank, is much harder. And by the way, uh, every rank in between the minimum and the maximum can certainly be attained by a completion because I can change the uh, unspecified entries one at a time from those of minimum rank to those of maximum rank. And since I change them one at a time, I can only change rank by one. So every intermediate rank will be attained. So the real question here is, what can you say about minimum rank? Okay? So let's start with a really simple case. Here it is. Let's suppose I've got a two by two matrix, and I've got three specified entries and one unspecified entry. What, what can happen? Let's just analyze it by brute force. Well, there are two possibilities. First of all, it might be that B is non-zero. And if B is non-zero, notice that no matter what A and C are, I can make the determinant of this matrix zero. And therefore, since B is non-zero, the rank of that resulting matrix would be exactly one. And I can't ever do better than one because B is non-zero. So there's a sub-matrix of rank one. Okay? So when B is non-zero, the minimum rank is exactly one. Nothing, no other possibility. The minimum rank is exactly one. Of course, the maximum rank is two, and that will be attained most of the time. Um, now, if B is zero, on the other hand, what can happen? Well, uh, either uh, A times C is non-zero, in which case the determinant of this will be non-zero, no matter what I choose for X, and in which case the minimum rank will be two, or if AC is zero, if A times C is zero, then no matter what I do for X, I'll get determinant zero, and the minimum rank will be either one or zero, depending on whether all these entries are zero or, uh, or whether one of them is, is non-zero. Okay? So it's easy to, easy to analyze. Well, let me summarize what I just said uh, in a sort of compact formula. Okay? Let's see. Uh, I'm going to look at the rank of this thing. Well, that's really easy. It's either 1 or 0. The rank of this thing, that's easy. It's either 1 or 0. And then the rank of the overlapping part, if you will. Again, that's easy, either 1 or 0. Now, you can check. In all the cases that I mentioned here, the minimum rank will be exactly this. Okay? Let's take an example. Let's suppose B is non-zero. Then this rank is 1, this rank is 1, and this rank is 1. And out of this formula, I get 1, which was exactly what I calculated by brute force. Okay? On the other hand, let's suppose B is 0, and let's suppose AC is non-zero. If B is 0 and AC is non-zero, then this rank is 1, because A is non-zero. This rank is 1 because C is not 0. And this rank is 0 because B is 0. In this case, I get 1 plus 1 minus 0 is 2, which is exactly what I calculated when AC was non 0. And again, you can go through the case AC equals 0, and you'll get uh, uh, something like you know, 1 plus 0 minus 0 is 1, and various other possibilities. So that uh, cute little shorthand. Uh, actually summarizes what's what's going on. <clears throat> well, I guess when you see something sort of scalar like that, you should ask whether it generalizes to blocks. And in fact, it does generalize to blocks. And here it is. If now I have a not necessarily square matrix partitioned as follows with A, B, and C specified, and x unspecified with a little bit of work, and this, by the way, would be a nice homework problem for your better students in the first course. It's a good one to give them. You, they, you can actually do this with completely elementary methods. But uh, you can calculate that the minimum possible rank you can get here, and you can use row reduction very nicely, is the rank of this block plus the rank of this block 
minus the length of the overlapping block. So inclusion exclusion sort of formula. Okay? And if you roll over this carefully and think a little bit, then you can get this result. So now you might ask, what, what are the patterns for the specified entries that allow us to get something similarly nice? Okay? And a good start on an answer to that question was provided by my colleague, uh, Hugo Werdemann. And uh, he showed that if the pattern for the specified entries is sort of block triangular, uh, then you get another uh, such a nice formula. So this is a result, in fact, it's the PhD, in the PhD thesis of Google Oregon. And the idea is the following. Suppose A has this pattern for the specified and unspecified entries. I, I get uh, a block here, block, you know, a block triangular pattern where all the stuff below the block triangular part is uh, unspecified and everything above is specified. And the diagonal blocks are specified. Okay? Then you get the following nice formula. Um, I add up the ranks of all blocks that look like this. All the maximal rectangular blocks. Next one would be this one. Next one would be this one outlined in red here. And so forth. So I take all the maximum rectangle, maximal rectangles and add up their ranks. Of course, that's way too much. So I need to subtract the ranks of the submaximal rectangles. Okay, so for example, I subtract this rank and then I subtract this rank, and then I subtract this rank, and so on. Okay? And when the dust clears, what I have is the minimum rank over all possible completions of this perhaps rectangular matrix. Okay? And that's uh, Hugo's, Hugo's formula. And in fact, you can, with careful use of row reduction, you can describe all the solutions that give minimum rank and basically they're sort of a bang-bang thing. When you put this in a nice form, uh, uh, you'll, you'll either have to take uh, certain specified entries to be very specific or quite arbitrary, depending on uh, what the stuff is. Okay. So there's a, there's a nice way to do it. Okay, so in any event, what happens for a pattern like this is that the minimum rank is predictable in terms of ranks of specified pieces. Okay? So this formula is just a sum and difference of ranks of certain submatrices consisting entirely of specified entries. That's it. Okay? So a natural question to ask is what other patterns share this property of having the minimum rank predictable in terms of ranks of submatrices. Okay? Well, sadly, or happily, depending on your point of view, uh, not every pattern has that property. Okay? And here's an example. Suppose the pattern is this one. I have these specified entries, and then on the diagonal I have all unspecified entries. Okay? Now here the diagonal is not very important. Okay. Now, if you think about it for a moment, if the data here happens to be all ones, then the minimum rank is certainly one because I can choose all the question marks to be one. And then I will have a rank one matrix, and I certainly can't get any less than one because I have sub-matrices of rank one. Okay? On the other hand, if the data is slightly different as here, I claim the minimum rank is two, and the reason for that is, you, you see it already, I guess. <laughs> the reason for that is the following. Um, let's see. Suppose I wanted to make, uh, suppose I wanted to make the rank of this one. If I were going to make the rank of the whole thing one, I would have to be able to make the rank of this one. 
And to make the length of this one, I would have to make the determinant zero, which would mean that I would have to put a two here. Okay? Now, if I wanted to make the length of this one, I would have to put a one half here. And if I wanted to make the rank of this guy one, I would have to put a one here. Uh, but now I have a one and a half and a one and a one, so I have a submatrix of rank two. So I did the best I could to try to keep the rank down, and I could not keep it below two. In fact, there is a rank two completion because I could choose this to be one and this to be one, and then this would be rank one, and so the worst that could happen is rank two. So the minimum rank is two. Okay? But let's take a look at the data. It's not very different. Okay? Here, every fully specified uh, principal submatrix, I'm sorry, every fully specified submatrix has rank one. Here's rank one, here's rank one, here's rank one, and so forth. Over here, every fully specified submatrix has rank one. Okay? So there's no difference in the ranks of the fully specified submatrices, and yet there is a difference in the minimum ranks. So for this pattern, I cannot uh, describe the minimum rank in terms of ranks of specified submatrices. Now perhaps that's unfortunate, but at least it makes the problem more interesting. Okay? So let me tell you what we know. And remember here, the quest is now to identify the patterns for which minimum rank is predictable in terms of ranks of subnames. That's, that's sort of the game. Okay? Uh, so a nice way to look at uh, the, the uh, Non, any sort of non-square completion problem is via a bipartite graph. And let's see. Let's see. Uh, should have had an example. But, okay, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, so uh, I can I can model the. Uh, positions of the specified entries with the bipartite graph, rows versus columns. I put an edge from row vertex i to column vertex j exactly when the ij entry is specified. Okay, so that's my bipartite graph. And now there's a concept already existing, by the way, of chordality in bipartite graphs, which is a little different from chordality for general undirected graphs. And uh, a bipartite graph is called bipartite chordal if it has no cordless uh, cycle of length six or more. Remember, in before we had four here, and now we have six in the bipartite case. And there's, a, there's actually a good, good reason for that. Okay? Um, and these, these have to do with uh, perfect edge elimination ordering bipartite graphs. And this has to do with uh, uh, modeling Gaussian elimination without fill when you get to pivot on arbitrary entries. Okay, there's a, there's a book by Columbia that has a nice dis discussion of several things about bipartite portal graphs. Okay, so that's what bipartite portal graphs are. And we're going to look at the specified entries in terms of uh, of uh, bipartite chordality. And now I need to um, say one more thing. Let's, let's think for a moment. We know this block triangular result. So if I have a big uh, partial matrix and I want to know about its minimum rank, then certainly its minimum rank is going to be uh, constrained by the minimum rank of any uh, block triangular uh, submatrix. Okay? So if I see this as a subpattern sitting somewhere in a bigger partial matrix, 
then I can calculate the minimum rank for this guy, and I certainly cannot get any smaller than that, right? Because rank is a monotone uh, property of sub-matrices, okay? So if this guy sits in there, and I calculate his minimum rank, then the minimum rank of the, of the uh, uh, partial matrix, the big partial matrix, cannot be any less than that. Okay, and this is all up to permutation equivalence. I could, I could see a pattern like this in perhaps strangely permuted form. Okay? So let's define the triangle minimum rank of a general uh, partial matrix to be the maximum of the minimum ranks where I take the minimum rank over all the triangular subpatterns. Okay? And I, the, the maximal triangular subpatterns will, will be enough, right? Because I mean, if I take a smaller piece of this, I can't get any more information. Okay? So what I know then is that the minimum rank for the entire matrix is at least as big as this triangle minimum rank because I can take the worst.